I'm Joshua Sparrow, Executive Director of the Briarfulton Touchpoint Center. We're here today to honor the life's work of Dr. T. Barry Brazelton and to work together to make the dreams we shared with him for all children and all families come true, with emphasis on the all. We came up with the idea for this Learning to Listen webinar series out of our wish to remember and honor Barry Brazelton's life's work. We determined that an overarching theme had always been learning to listen, and that was the title of his last book, A Memoir. And then one of his first books was called To Listen to a Child. Babies and children have much to teach us about how to listen and communicate, even before they can speak, about how to listen across differences. Our hope is that what babies and children can teach us about listening across differences can help us listen to each other and to ourselves in this world where there is so much more noise than understanding. Eight days before Barry's death at about this time a year ago, and just a few months shy of his 100th birthday, which would have been on May 10th of last year, Barry said that today's family's concerns are not the same as when he was in practice. Today, he said, parents are worried about digital technology, social media, guns in schools, violence in the world, and the polarized politics in which it has become harder and harder to really listen to each other. And yet we think there are answers to today's challenges in what every baby knows, if only we listen. Barry's studies of newborn behavior revealed previously unrecognized competencies in brand new babies because he stopped to listen closely and observe carefully. Barry's research with colleagues on the earliest infant parent interactions revealed the microsecond to microsecond nonverbal cues that are the foundation of human com communication throughout the lifespan. We hope that with this Learning to Listen webinar and podcast series, we can listen to what infants, toddlers, and young children can teach us about how they listen and learn so that we can all do our part to help our, learn, our world learn to listen. A little bit of technical information before going further. If you have any technical difficulties, please email Kayla Savelli at kayla.savelli at childrens.harvard.edu. That's K-A-Y-L-A dot S-A-V-E-L-L-I at childrens with an S, no apostrophe, dot harvard.edu. And please do let her know the best way to reach you. You can click on um, the link on the browsewebtouchpoints.org website to watch the Learning to Listen webinar by Alicia Lieberman called Listening to Fear about trauma in young children and to watch today's webinar at a future time. You can also find these webinars on our YouTube page. We're so glad you are with us today and hope you'll come back again on Tuesday, June 4th at 12 noon Eastern and 9 a.m. Pacific for internationally renowned early language development researcher Kathy H. Hirsch Pasek, whose webinar is on the earliest conversations, how babies learn language with the people who love them. Thank you all for joining us and for all you do for children and families everywhere. Thanks also go to Kayla Savelli, Michael Accardi, Susan Okasik, and everyone here at the Browsleton Touchpoint Center for all of their hard work to bring the Learning to Listen webinar series to you. Before turning to today's featured presenter, Professor Jun Lei Lee, who uh, I can't thank enough for joining us, I want to be sure to thank our Learning to Listen webinar series sponsors, without whom we would not be with you today. The Burke Foundation, First Five Santa Clara County in California, Mitchell Gold and Bob Williams Home Furnishings. And I want you to know that Mitchell Gold has been a national champion in bringing together religious leaders and LGBTQ advocates to learn to listen to each other across major differences. They're all part of the Browson Touchpoint Center family. 
here today with us, we have all of you practitioners from all of the family facing sectors, researchers, policymakers, funders, and parents from around the country and around the world. We also have with us today, June Lei Li, who will talk with us about how to listen with more than our ears, helping children through simple, ordinary interactions. We will try to save some time after his talk to respond to your questions and comments in the chat box if we can. Jun Lei Li is the Saul Zant Senior Lecturer in Early Childhood Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. His research and practice focuses on understanding and supporting the work of helpers, those who serve children and families on the front lines of education and social services. Jun Lei Li studied and learned from a wide range of developmental settings with low resources, but high quality practices, including orphanages, childcare, classrooms, and community youth programs. He developed the simple interactions approach to help identify what ordinary people do extraordinarily well with children in everyday moments, and made that the basis for promoting positive system change. He frequently delivers keynote presentations and workshops for national, state, and international conferences focused on improving practices, programs, and policies for children, families, and professionals with a particular emphasis on early childhood development. He teaches about improving human interactions and supporting adult helpers at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and Lausanne's Professional Learning Academy. His work is significantly influenced and inspired by the pioneering work of Fred Rogers, creator of course of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He previously served as the co-director and Rita M. McGinley Professor for Early Learning and Children's Media at the Fred Rogers Center at St. Vincent College. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jun Lei Li. Um, I know we're in for a real treat. Thank you. Um, it's just a pleasure and an honor to be here to celebrate um, the legacy of Dr. Brazelton. Um, as I was, um, over the, the last few months, as I was thinking about um, what is it that we can share that fits into this theme of learning to listen? Um, I went back actually to the um, Fred um, Rogers archive as well as with the uh, help of your office here um, at the Brazilton, at the Brazilton Touchpoint um, uh, Center. We were able to find um, some of the correspondences that went between Mr. Rogers and Dr. Brazilton um, and, and most of these um, are letters of kind of mutual gratitude and admiration mm -hmm. that they had to each other, uh, in particular uh, in relation to the work that the two of them are so interested in, in um, promoting better health care and hospital care for um, children. Now, when I think of kind of Fred uh, uh, Rogers and Dr. Brazelton, these are the pioneers um, in the early childhood field, but on the surface level, they had so much in common. They're about 10 years apart. Uh, Dr. Brazelton is uh, older, and they both had long running television programs <laughs> uh, that made the knowledge and the ideas of child development accessible. Um, they both uh, were trained and were associating with some of the very same people. Um, they both give credit, for example, to Dr. Benjamin Spock. Um, not only for thinking about child development, but for developing a way of communicating with parents that trusted parents' capacity, that relied on parents' strength, rather than pointing out what parents are always doing wrong, uh, the kind of, kind of parenting guide that preceded um, Dr. Spock's book uh, for families and so on. Um, so as I was thinking, you know, here I'm sitting in the Brazilton Touchpoint Center, thinking about what does it mean to carry on the legacy of the pioneers uh, ahead of us? What does it mean to not only study kind of their legacy and their ideas, but to take it forward in our time um, to help to meet the needs or the changing needs of families and children, as well as the professionals uh, who are helping families and children? So for us, I think a lot of this work has come to this idea of really kind of spending time to see and to listen to children's helpers, 
their parents, their early childhood educators, their counselors, mentors, to really look at how um, the helpers work with children. Um, I want to start with just a very brief example. So this came from a colleague of mine named Kelly Rodden Bush. Um, her small organization, Sparrow Fund, is an entity that goes overseas and supports the caregivers in orphanages in China as well as other places. So a while back um, when she was um, visiting and working in one of the orphanages, um, she was, I think what she described to me, she was just running by the hallway trying to get to a meeting and she looks through this door and she sees these two caregivers on the floors of the orphanage. Um, they were just, it, it was just feeding time and she pulled out her cell phone, just very quickly captured about 10 seconds of what feeding time is like and then she went on. And later on in the, in the evening when she was going through her phone and looking at the pictures and videos, she thought this one was so striking that overnight she sent it over to me in my office at the Fred um, uh, Rogers Center. So we both kind of shared a moment of, uh, of, of uh, understanding just over this very short video. So to just provide this with a little bit of a, a context. So in the context of uh, orphanage care, moments like feeding or diaper change or bathing or changing clothes, those are moments that are often um, overlooked because they're so mundane. They're not the play time, they're not the literacy time, they're just everyday mundane. But often in the context of orphanages or institutions, these mundane moments are incredibly telling of the quality of care in that kind of a place. Um, because of the staff and child ratios and because of the institutionalization of places like that, mundane moments are often done in a procedural, almost factory assembly line kind of a way. And so often you can tell the difference between an institutionalized setting like an orphanage from kind of everyday family or, or childcare kind of environment by just looking at how these mundane moments go. So anyhow, I just wanted to first share with you just about 10 seconds of this quick moment that she captured um, as she walked by this particular uh, infant room. <laughs> so that's all, right? So um, if, if, you know, if this was a live workshop, we can think about like, what is the you notice about these kind of moments? Um, it, it seem incredibly ordinary and in a way quiet, not that different from what it might look like right in our own homes. But that's exactly what makes it extraordinary because it isn't in a home. It is in a low resource community where staff have huge workload and that the institution kind of expects them to complete the feeding process, not just for these few children, but for every child in the ward within a very short amount of time. So these caregivers have neither the training nor the time, nor the institutional empowerment um, to do things in a way that we typically would think about we do at home. But in that brief moment, you see the kind of level of interactions that they're able to put into the most ordinary and the mundane moment. Um, so in, you know, I think we're sitting right here outside Fenway Park. Mm. And so it made me think of kind of, you know, when we watch a sports game online, uh, we, the average kind of viewers, sometimes can't appreciate the nuances of a particularly incredible play. And the sports casters would do kind of a slow motion, instant replay. And, and, and so that, just so that we can see the nuances. So I thought that an ordinary moment like this in an orphanage deserve a replay as well. So I'm just gonna go to the replay. And in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna slow down the footage, remove the sound, slow down the footage. And if you could, if you could just kind of keep your eye on this pair right here, right? But, um, uh, the pair, I think on the left hand of the screen and just look at their interaction and perhaps look at the order in which their interactions happen. Ow. 
But I don't know if you noticed or not, right? So typically, you know, when we think about kind of a server and return interaction, right? Here we have at least two server and return interactions with the baby's shoulder, where the baby kind of raises the shoulder and the adult reciprocates that. A lot of times, I think early on, if, if, if it goes fast, we just see kind of the baby maybe mirroring the adult. But in fact, in this moment, what you see is the adult mirroring the baby. That even in the act of kind of feeding, you know, trying to get the food through, the adult is just aware enough and present enough to pick up the cue that the baby have raised the shoulder and then she reciprocates and the baby does it again and she reciprocates again. And all of that happening a very short time span of just about 10 seconds. Okay. So I'm gonna go back one more time and we're just gonna look at just the shoulders of the baby and the adult and look at kind of the order in which it happens. Ow. So you see the first serve coming with the baby right now and the adult reciprocates and the food goes in. You'd expect, let's get the task done, but no, the baby does this a second time and the adult reciprocates a second time. And that isn't the job of that moment. The job of that moment is to get these baby fed and move on to the next one. But somehow, right, the caregiver was able to make that moment a kind of interactions that supports the child's development by just being present to what that child needs. Okay? And it's not just what the child says, but just to be open enough to see what the child needs. And what a moment like that, I think, help us to understand are two things. One is that every child, even the child who has grown up in an orphanage, right, who doesn't have the benefit of having grown up in a family and so on, demonstrates this fundamental developmental need for human interactions. And that need doesn't take precedence. It's not like, well, I need to eat now, I'll worry about interactions later. Like even in the moment of I'm hungry, I like to eat, there's still this irrepressible need of their need for these human interactions. But at the same time, what we see is the natural capacity of the adult to provide something that matches that need, to provide a developmental experience, even just in the shrugging of the shoulders, that matches the need of the child. And these two things are present simultaneously in that very simple, mundane moment. And the reason I think this is so important, I think most of us understand that children have the need to interact. They need that interaction as much as they need other nutrients in their environment. But I think one of the biggest revolutions in how we think about adult capacity started with Dr. Benjamin Spock and Dr. Brazelton and someone like Fred Rogers, which is to recognize that families, parents, teachers, and so on, they have the capacity to provide that matching experience. And the way we tend to think of it is if nature have helped to evolve, help children to evolve so that they naturally have that need, then nature must have also evolved the capacity around the children to meet that need. It would be a terrible mistake for one end of the interaction to have this great need, and whereas there's no capacity on the other end to meet it. So in our thinking, as we go across these different settings, when we think of any kind of a moment, however small it is, however mundane it is, where we see the need and the capacity coming together, that's a moment where we have a kind of human interaction that constitute what we might call a developmental relationship. A developmental relationship simply means a kind of human relationship that helps the child to develop in some way. So why does this matter? Why does finding a mundane, ordinary moment and finding the child's need and the adult's capacity, even in a place like orphanage, matter? It matters in particular in how we think about the quality of early childhood environments, how we define quality, how we measure quality, how we grow it. But it fundamentally has to do with 
the issue of equity. How can we support the kind of quality that is accessible, affordable to children everywhere, particularly those in communities where they have very little access to resources? The traditional way of thinking about quality tends to hold up this kind of idealized standard of what quality should be, what it should look like, and often it seems synonymous to this idea of having resources, having physical resources, material, material resources, and even professional resources. And often we think of kind of high quality as having these resources, and therefore those who serve in communities where they have very low access to these resources are often considered on the low quality end, that they seem very, very far apart from how we think about quality. But when we can see right, that even in a low resource orphanage with caregivers who have relatively minimal training and support, when we see that they have the capacity to meet the needs of the children, the needs for these human interactions, then it make us think differently about what quality could mean and how do we close the gap between quality and resources. And in fact, um, a while ago I was sitting at church on a Sunday morning and it was a little distracted. So something on the program reads like this, um, and I'm just gonna blow it up here. It says that whatever it is, right, that we see it in unexpected places, we experience it at unexpected times, and we see it in others' hearts and lives, but not always in our own. And I was just replacing the word it with quality in my mind and go, what does it mean to be open enough, to be humble enough, to look for quality in places that we typically don't expect, and to look for quality in, at times that we don't expect, even times as simple as feeding. And over the years, we have gone to these unexpected places and looked at these unexpected times from little orphanage settings in rural communities in China to schools for children with special needs to public schools uh, in high poverty neighborhoods all the way to street corners where we see the crossing guards helping children cross the street where they only have about five, 10 seconds of interaction with children, but nevertheless, they really show up for these interactions. Hospital environments where child life specialists trying to normalize the experience that children have in the hospital. Out of school time programs, this is in California serving mostly children from migrant labors in the Central Valley area. And as far as going to places like a residential youth home, none of these places in our typical conceptions would come out as kind of places where you expect to see high quality human interactions, particularly in relation to children or youth. But in each one of those places, we manage to just observe the high quality interaction that exists in the most mundane, ordinary moments. And if we can think about quality like that, then we can think about quality not as something that's synonymous with resources, but in fact that that quality is something we can have access to on both ends of the resources. And what is particularly hopeful for us is to find the intersection of high quality practices in very low resource communities. If that exists, if, that, if we can see that, if we can listen to that, then we might be able to start the conversations about how do we recognize that, how do we celebrate that, and most importantly, how do we support the growth of high quality practices in low resource communities. So um, I wanted to share with you just a, a very short kind of uh, story from the project that was headed by my colleague, uh, Dr. Dana Winters at the Fred Rogers Center. Um, her team has spent uh, the last two years working uh, in the state of Georgia uh, with low to mid resource uh, childcare centers and preschools um, on a birth to three kind of language and literacy effort. Um, they are there to support the um, infant toddler specialists of the state who goes out to support center directors and lead teachers and so on. And 
here's just a very brief moment that they captured uh, in the context of uh, an infant toddler uh, classroom um, just outside um, Atlanta. And here's a teacher and pretty soon you'll see kind of three different children of varying ages kind of within that infant toddler band. You making bubbles? You making bubbles? Here, get your car. Hey, you gonna play the cards with us? You gonna play the cards with us? kind of moment if we had the time I mean uh, if we had a in-person kind of workshop I think all of us could probably spend about 20-30 minutes just talking about everything that is happening in a moment like that um, now that project in part came about because of um, I don't know if you've heard of it so that this idea of this word gap challenge and the word gap challenge I think the way it's typically described is that, that for children in low-income families, often by the time uh, they get to age three, that there's a pretty large vocabulary gap uh, in children. And, and some, some people have kind of, I think, attributed to kind of the number of words they would hear uh, within kind of their early learning environment. And as a, a result, there's a lot of effort and in investment in early um, language and literacy going to birth and three, which is why a project like that even happened. Um, so for the teachers, for example, in that project, uh, I don't know if you noticed that the children all were wearing a vest because part of what they're being assessed on is using this little kind of word pedometer that's trying to capture the number of words that are being said and so on. So it's a little bit like listening to interactions with your ears, um, but without the benefit of actually seeing. So if you can't see and if you count the words, then what are the things you count? Well, you count the number of words per hour, the adults are saying, as well as some of the conversational terms. While that may capture part of what is happening here, imagine if you just watched that video clip, but with your eyes closed, or if we have frozen the video so that you can't see anything, all, you, all you're doing is you're just listening to the sound. 
I think if we did that, we would miss a lot of what is actually happening in that particular moment. In that particular, if you think back to the moment, what you notice is that there weren't a lot of words that are actually being spoken. And there are, there are a limited number of conversational turns if you measure conversation by the sounds that both sides make. Right? Some of the children, they're very young. They're not sharing words yet. Right? And a lot of their communication is physical or emotional and so on. And what this points to is this like, struggle that often we have in research as well as in early childhood policy, as well as any kind of edu educational policy, uh, that what counts cannot always be counted and what can be counted does not always count, right? And this isn't just kind of a, a hunch. So um, our colleagues, Meredith Rowan at the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Edu Education and Barry Zuckerman uh, here in Boston, um, a while ago um, they had wrote kind of a very brief, succinct summary of what have we learned about children's language development since the, since the word gap study in the 90s. And I just wanted to kind of bring their words here um, to give us a sense of kind of what, how has the science itself grown, right? So the idea of a word gap, the idea of counting the number of words children hear uh, oversimplifies the phenomenon of language development. Uh, the implied focus on the quantity of parent talk Obscure the fact, obscures the fact that there are more essential components of parent-child communication that go beyond just hearing more words and specifically developmental sequence and quality. Now sequence in this case just means that you see kind of three children who are in different part of their developmental sequence. You have an infant, you have young toddlers, and each of them need different kinds of interaction, not just more quantities of talk. And quality is something that as you watch the video, you can just feel viscerally that there is this, this quality in their interactions. And so they went on to say that parents should not get the wrong message. And it's not just parents, but educators as well, should not get the wrong message and be stressed out about talking all the time or meeting a set number of word quotas per day. Instead, they should focus on finding time for even brief, high quality, loving interactions the kind of high quality loving interaction we might see on the floors of an orphanage or right here on the floors of an infant toddler room um, in Georgia. And what, what, do, what does brief high quality interactions look like? Right? We can see it in these interactions. Um, what we have tried to understand across all the different settings we have visited is what are the universal patterns or elements of what makes a high quality interaction, the kind of interactions that ultimately builds towards the kind of human relationships we want surrounding children. What we have found over time is that it comes down to kind of these four overlapping dimensions. These are not check boxes to be checked off. Um, they are kind of these underlying strands of what makes an interaction work. The first one is the sense of connection. And the way that we think of connection is just two people interacting with either mutually positive or just generally appropriate emotional levels that seem to connect and match each other. Okay? So what we are seeing in that particular clip, for example, is that the adult and the child, they seem to be present, they seem to be in tune to each other. The two diagrams here just means that, that you can be smiling, of course, but you don't have to be. It's not about how much you smile, it's just the nature of the connection that you observe in that kind of a moment. And I don't know if you, you notice between that caregiver and the infant, the infant is looking very serious the whole time because he's exerting great effort, right, to do this. So it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to be smiling together, but they're just in tune. Now, other modes of interaction could be that you have one side of the interaction seem very positive or very eager and the other side just are unwilling to match you. And that happens from time to time. And of course, there are instances in which we, we can observe interactions where people are either mutually negative or hostile, or sometimes worse than that, they appear detached as if the other person doesn't exist. And all these are common modes 
of connection or the lack thereof kind of in uh, uh, any kind of a setting that has human interaction. And so the way we think about this isn't that we're going to score a teacher or a particular setting a high score if they're always on one side versus the other. But each of these are just a mode of interaction. It's what we can use to describe the interactions. And often you can imagine, right, in order to move towards Z, you might have to go through Y or you might have to go through X, that each of them may be necessary at any particular point in order to kind of gradually build our relationship. Not all relationship is all present and happy all the time, but any kind of developmental relationship tries to shift, I think, from left to right intentionally over time, even if sometimes the shifts feels like three steps forward and two steps back. So the second component that we see in interaction like that is this notion of reciprocity, or sometimes what we may call uh, what the Harvard Center on the Developing Child for a while has been calling it kind of the server and return interaction. You saw it in the orphanage caregiver earlier, where unless we slow the footage down, we can't actually tell who's doing the serve and who's doing the return. And we see it again here in terms of what people are able to do um, when they're in that interaction with the children where, where the interaction just seems balanced and that there isn't a sense that one person is driving everything. Other modes of interaction can include that one person, right? dominates or drives most of the interactions and the other, let's say the child, complies with it. They comply with it because they like you or they're afraid of you, but either way they're kind of following along. And of course there's the context in which they can't or they, they resist, they disengage, that too much of the interaction is driven by one side. And again, kind of these XYZs are the common modes of reciprocity. It doesn't inherently mean that if you're in the middle of Y or even X, that's the wrong thing to do. It just means that sometimes you have to go through some of these phases in order to keep moving towards the kind of interaction that you're hoping for. The third of the, the, the four dimensions is this idea of inclusion or, or create kind of the sense of belonging for whoever is in that context. We think of inclusion as, um, whether or not we're able to invite and involve children who for whatever reason seem to be the least likely or least able to engage in the activity at the time. Now, sometimes that can be because of an ability or disability. Sometimes it can be because of temperament, but whatever it is, typically whenever you see a group of children, you might see that some of them just for whatever reason seem least likely and able to be included and the extent to which that the grown-ups intentionally trying to bring them into the fold create a sense of belonging, a sense of inclusion amongst the community. So in the case that we just saw, the three children have very different abilities, are in different places in development of sequence, but all of them, all of them are invited and included in the context of whatever it is that they are doing. Now, of course, there are times that it may be necessary to attend to the children who seem least likely separately, just to make sure that they get the attention and to scaffold them to join the rest of the group. But there are also times where we exclude them, not intentionally, but sometimes it just it comes natural to us to interact with those children who interact readily with us. And that it is sometimes, if we're not intentional, it's easy to leave a child excluded. And there are times in which it may be necessary to allow a child some space to be by, by themselves, but not permanently there. And again, same thing, thinking about these not as scores, but thinking about these as typical modes of interaction and think about kind of what are we seeing and, 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 and where are we in these interactions if we're the one uh, who are serving children directly. And the last one, uh, in these dimensions is this thought of opportunity to grow. And what we're seeing in the infant toddler room, each child are trying to grow in a different way. For some children, it's language. For the baby, it's just this idea to be able to stand up and to be able to elicit 
and sustain an interaction with an adult. For another child, it may be trying to go from high five to high 10, but whatever it is, the interaction itself is creating room to both support their growth, but to also fade some of the support so that the children are stretched to just do a little more than what they're comfortable with. And, and you can see that kind of interaction um, in ordinary mundane moments. There are other times with the support of curriculums and curriculum and training. Um, a lot of teachers are very good at kind of identifying a, a larger goal, but break it down into smaller chunks. The difference between the Y here and the Z earlier is whether or not we create opportunities for children to just stretch, to take a leap into the challenge, to do just a little more than what they're capable of. And of course, there are times and settings in which we've seen children, either the expectation for their learning or for their behavior is just simply too, too high and the support is too low that it become unrealistic to expect them to be able to make that growth or the expectation is so low that what they're doing seem undemanding and repetitive. And that these are kind of the three common modes when it comes to learning and growing that we can observe in these interactions. And for those of you who are interested, um, we have more detailed descriptions of these dimensions as well as the visual tool that's freely accessible um, at the website simpleinteractions.org. But the reason we think about these interactions in that way um, is to think about kind of how do we support our efforts to close the gap between what we typically think of as high quality and we, what we typically think of as low resource communities. And that if we are to seriously think about how do we connect to these two? How do we bridge resource and quality? In particular, be able to recognize high quality practice in low resource environments. Um, it is to focus on the human interactions, to see high quality human interactions in places we may not typically expect or in times that we may not typically expect. And it gets to this idea of what really is the active ingredient of the quality of our work. And the notion of active ingredient has been around for quite a while. The Center on Developing Child, when they were founded, um, their very first uh, policy paper was Young Children Develop in an Environment of Relationships, and that relationships are the active ingredients of the environment's influence on healthy human development. Early on when I read the paper, I just thought, wow, active ingredient just means it's one of those important things. And later on, I thought maybe the word active meant something more just than just important. And that in the context of toothpaste, when I used to kind of supervise my children brushing their teeth, and I remember reading the back of the toothpaste box, which looks like this for most people, you notice there are two boxes, right? One of them says active ingredient and the other says inactive ingredients. And the active ingredient for almost all brands of toothpaste is some form of fluoride, but it's a single item. And the list of inactive ingredients goes on and on and on, right? And in this context, what we're seeing is that in, in the context of the toothpaste, what we're seeing is that fluoride is the thing that prevents cavity. Now, I, I just circled two inactive ingredients that I can pronounce, flavor and color. Flavor and color does not prevent cavity, but they're not useless, because at least for my kids, the bubblegum flavor is what helps them to hold the toothpaste in their mouth for three minutes, so the flora and I have a chance to work. So the relationship between active and inactive is that the inactive ingredients are helpful if and only if they help the active ingredient work. In the toothpaste, if you remove the fluoride, if you dilute the fluoride, it doesn't really matter how many inactive ingredients you have. You can't prevent cavity. And so taking this idea forward to our work with children, um, we thought, well, what if we think of children's development like a tube of toothpaste? And if we were to have to label it, 
of all the things we have and we do if we were to label it. And what if we labeled it where the human interaction, the quality of human interaction is the fluoride of our work? That everything else we do from the curriculum to the buildings and so on, they are inactive ingredients in that they're helpful, but they're helpful if and only if they support ultimately the quality of the human relationships, the human interactions around the child. And what that brings us to is that regardless of what role we play, in the professional context when it comes to children, it comes down to this filling the blank kind of a question, right? So if we write in the blank space, the thing that we actually do, whether it has to do with practice, a, po a program, a policy, the question then becomes, how does this thing we do help to encourage, enrich, and empower the human interactions around the child? To the extent that we can answer that question affirmatively, or at least in a promising way, and I feel like we're in the right direction. And if we can think of things we're filling in the blank that actually does the opposite of this, then it's time to re-examine our assumptions and re-examine our approaches. In part because I think any kind of a pro practice or program and policy, they ultimately help children learn and grow if and only if they encourage, enhance, and empower the human relationship around the child. If they don't, right, if they even dilute and diminish the quality of human relationship around the child, it's hard to imagine that practices, programs, and policies work. And so that leads us back to kind of why we thought and felt it was so important to see the helpers, see their work, and to truly listen to the helpers in terms of how they are seeing and listening to the children in the most ordinary mundane moments, even in communities that have low access to resources that we don't typically associate with high quality practices. And what it comes down to is that it's not just seeing and listening, it is a collective effort for all of us to be able to help the helpers, whether they're parents or they're frontline, pro frontline pro uh, professionals, my colleague, uh, Noni LaSalle and Stephanie Jones of the Harvard SENS Initiative uh, often says that we need to be as invested in the helpers as they are in our children, and that in the field of early childhood, we simply cannot make a lasting impact by children if we skip over the adults in the middle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jun Lee. Lee. This was a beautiful talk, and I think that everybody who um, has been listening and watching who is familiar with uh, Dr. Browson's life's work will recognize the roots of um, just about everything that you've said in uh, the research that began 50 years ago. Um, I wanted to go back to highlight some of that research. Back in the 1970s, Barry Brazelton, Ed Tronic, Colin Trevarthen were all working in Jerome Bruner's um, lab at Harvard. And uh, that was where the first face-to-face -face and still-face experiments were done with very young babies, at least as young as eight weeks of age, where they looked, as you did, frame by frame at the videos and saw uh, these very early interactions and saw uh, what they called matches and mismatches uh, or errors and repairs every three to five seconds. And one of the really important and beautiful things about realizing there are these mismatches, which you showed us, is that that's where the opportunity for learning is, is in making the reparation from the mismatch to getting reconnected again. Uh, other people who found similar phenomena were Lynn Murray in um, England and um, Dan Stern when he was working um, in New York uh, at that time. So. I guess one of my questions is, it's been a long time. <laughs> and then the beautiful videos that you showed, you know, we saw the the face-to-face -face attention of the, the baby and the child caregiver talking about making bubbles, and then the the shared or joint attention to the objects, the, the little car, um, and then the coming back together again. Um, it's been a long time that um, the world of child development has known this. I mean, 30 years before, 
the Center for the Developing Child. The Center for the Developing Child has been um, an important force in helping package some of this. Um, the serve and return metaphor has gotten some traction. It's also created some controversy because um, it is, um, you know, thought of as a relatively inaccessible and elite sport. <laughs> and this kind of interaction is not a sport, it's not competitive. Um, I think others like to think of it more as making music together or, you know, improvising music together. But what, what do we need to do so that there is broader understanding of what these human interactions consist of, what these bright spots are, even in places with limited material resources, so that we then can make this shift that you're talking about uh, to support um, the helpers, which has also been what the work of our, our Browson Touchpoint Center has been about for more than 20 years. That's right. And, and I think one of the challenges we have in the field is that we have grown so much, I think, in the last half a century or longer in terms of understanding what children need and, and, and developing tools and measures to think about kind of how do children learn and grow, how do children develop. But I think as a field, both on the research side and the policy and program side, I don't think we've invest enough uh, in thinking about how do you help the helpers and, and what are the strategies that are helpful to the helpers. Um, there are of course the work of touch points and so on who are expanding that but by and large um, when you think about early childhood professionals um, they lack the kind of support that ties closely to their practice. Um, they lack the kind of professional development that ultimately respects and honors their work. Um, just a few days ago, I was re reading a few articles in Edu Education Week about what do we lack in professional development, even for K through 12 teachers, yeah. <laughs> right? And there were like three or four articles and every single one had the same conclusion, which is that the thing that teachers want the most out of these professional development, but not getting is respect. Mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. imagine in particular in low resource communities, often the teachers and the providers there gets the least amount of respect mm -hmm. um, because they don't have the right amount of degrees and because their centers may not have the right number of stars in a quality rating system. But it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that high quality practices does not exist in places like that. Mm -hmm. And so the more that we can use our appreciation and our understanding to offer encouragement, enrichment, and empowerment for the helpers on the front line, particularly helpers in low resource communities. I think the more we get closer to integrating this rich field of science with the equally rich kind of ground practice, right, of the early childhood work. So, um... I was gonna ask you, when we look at these beautiful videos that you have of these wonderful interactions, the, the feeding and the playing interactions, um, what, what do you think the, those helpers have going on? What, what are they getting and where are they getting it from that allows them to do this wonderful work in such a beautiful and powerful way? Where does it come from? What are, they, what are they getting and where is it coming from? Yeah, so um, your question reminded me um, this, uh, this saying, I think, from St. Francis of Assisi, that those who work with their hands are laborers and those who work with their hands and their mind are craftsmen and those who work with their hands and mind and heart are artists. Mm. And I think of the core of the early childhood profession as the kind of artists, even though so many in the early childhood profession, particularly in the childcare side, are paid as if they're laborers. But that so often when we see the kind of practice they have, we feel like it comes from their heart and comes from their experience. And what seemed to help is that if we can help providers and teachers to do intentionally what they already do intuitively, 
and that seemed to be most helpful. So when we work, for example, uh, in a rural community of, of, uh, of Chinese, essentially farmers who are taking care of children with severe disabilities um, as foster care children, none of the farmers had any formal training. And so what we would do is we would go in there and we would capture videos of their actual work. We would replay the videos for them just the way we did it here and ask them what they saw in the video. And I remember about 10 years ago, uh, after one of the workshops, I asked one, uh, five of the, 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 the women who are farmers who were in the video that was shown to all their peers, I asked them, so you already do it. So you do it because you, once upon a time you were a foster mom, you know, you just, you have, and you know the children well, so what's the point of seeing yourself on video and hearing your peers talk about it? Like, but you already do it. And her, their answers always kind of remain with me. So she said that there were, there were five women and, and they all said pretty much the same thing. One, they didn't know what they were doing were good. Nobody told them because they were farmers. People just always told them they're not professional. But in fact, their work exemplified professionalism. And two, they said, while it makes us feel good that what we're doing is of value, it's much more important that we know why what we're doing is good for the children. Because knowing why helps to give us a sense of purpose and direction tomorrow. And somehow I just always remember these few words that they have said to, to us. And we have experienced that over and over again in multiple low resource settings is that they may be doing it, they're not, they don't have the support to quite know it. But if they know it, they can grow from that knowledge. And that the more we can do in professional development and compensation, everything to convey our support and our respect for the frontline educators, as well as the helpers, like parents, I think the more we're getting closer to this idea of building a robust and high quality and equitable early childhood system. So it's seeing what you're already doing so that you know it, you grow it, value it and know that it is valued so that there is a sense of purpose that nourishes and sustains the work. That's um, the artist's dream. Well, I, I don't know how much of this you did yourself, the wonderful drawings and diagrams, but if you did, you worked with your hands. If not, at least you were playing with your computer today. <laughs> so um, hands, mind, and heart, you truly are an artist. And um, this is a perfect place to stop. I wish that Mr. Rogers and Barry Brazelton were here to um, see the wonderful work that you're doing now. Thank you so much, Jun Lee, Lee. And thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, and it's just an honor to try to continue the legacy of Dr. Brazelton and Fred Ro Rogers, Benjamin Spock, <laughs> and all those pioneers that have gone before us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.